Pray. Thank you very much for that introduction. Thank you to my colleagues at Cambridge, particularly Mistral, who, uh, who is here. So if you want to talk about our work, go find him later. So as I'm sure you're all aware, natural and physical scientists write a lot of code. It's very common these days, well, it has been for the last 50 years, to write large, complicated models as programs, models of our real world. And increasingly, in recent years, scientists have been uh, become increasingly aware of the need to do verification of their code. They've always been looking at validation from a scientific point of view. Now they realize we need to really make sure that this code is correct. And over on the computer science side, we're saying, yeah, that's a great idea. Yeah, let's verify your programs. And we've been making lots of progress in program verification over the last 10 years. But unfortunately, very little of that is used in science. So the overarching goal of our project, which we've been working on for a few years, is to bridge this chasm between computer science and the natural and phys physical sciences. So we've been talking to a lot of scientists, and we've been looking at their code. And we see a lot of code that looks a bit like this, a sort of array computation. This is Fortran code. So if you're not so familiar, this is really just a for loop. We have some induction variable i. And inside the for loop, we read from the array a. We do some indexing. This is an array index, not a function call. And we read from a at the location i, i plus 1, i minus 1. We do some computation. And then we write that back in some array. Now, we looked at code and saw, yeah, this pattern happens quite a lot. And I think this is generally known in the folklore that this is a very common pattern in numerical computations. This is also called a stencil computation because we're writing back into an array. And you get things that are a bit similar when you're doing things like reductions. But this is a bit of an idealized example. What we actually see is things more like this. This, is, comes, from a, this comes from a fluid dynamic simulator, Navier-Stokes. And it's the same kind of principle, but you have this huge, dense miasma of indexing terms. You're reading from two arrays, but you have loads of indexing, and there's lots of minus one, plus ones. And it's very easy as a human to make a mistake when transcribing this. So we saw this pattern quite often. We thought, well, what can we do about it? Scientists tend to do testing. Sometimes they do a kind of, uh, they look at it and see if it smells right. So does this look like a fluid simulator when they run it? Um, they might check against some real-world data, or they might check against analytical solutions. But we, as we looked at code, we saw actually there, there's, there's quite common patterns here. Maybe we could build a verification tool. So the idea was to build a simple specification language for the shape of array access patterns, and then build a verification tool, lightweight verification tool for scientists to use. We built everything on top of CAMFOR. That's our sort of infrastructure for doing analysis of Fortran code and verification of Fortran code. But, we, but before we did this, we really needed to collect some data about how do scientists actually use arrays. And we couldn't find any serious data out there other than just you know, our anecdotes and our feelings. So we put together a corpus of 11 real-world scientific software packages, um, big climate models, things from physics, uh, and as well as a few libraries that people commonly use, numerical libraries. And it's roughly 1.1 million physical lines of code. So that's excluding comments and white space. And then we designed a, a little tool for doing uh, large-scale ana uh, analysis of array uh, programming idioms over this. So some of our initial hypotheses, this sort of general folklore idea of, yes, array computations are very common. We wanted to check that. And also our, our, our observation was that mostly arrays are read with a very static fixed pattern. Uh, based on what we call neighborhood indices. So that's when you have an induction variable and you do some constant offsets from it. So we collected the data, and we found that there are 133,000 array computations that's involving a single array at a time uh, over our 1.1 million lines of code. So yeah, they're pretty common. And uh, we also threw a fine indices into the mix and had a look at those as well. When we're looking at static patterns, that's when you, have, uh, you multiply by a scalar, then add a scalar. And we found that just over 75% of all array computations read from arrays with just using uh, neighborhood indexing or refine indexing. And actually, refine was, was actually relatively uncommon. That usually corresponds to sort of hand-rolled optimizations, and, and people tend to do that themselves. Uh, let the, sorry, let the compiler do it rather than doing it themselves. So our initial hypothesis was confirmed that uh, people use arrays with these sort of neighborhood accesses. We had a few other observations. One is that they, have a, they use a, a contiguous pattern of array reads, so without holes in it, 
And they also tend to include the origin point. So if you've got some induction variables ij, then they index from uh, their array a at ij. So that's sort of neighborhood with zero offsets. So we collected the data. Indeed, 72% of all array computations are neighborhood, use neighborhood indexing, which is contiguous. 70% of all array computations are neighborhood contiguous and they involve this origin point. So you've got a sort of little fixed pattern of reads around the origin. Sometimes they're just uh, slightly offset by one. We call that a straddle, so next to the origin. And we did find some non-contiguous behavior as well, but at a smaller proportion. So the paper has lots more details about the sort of fine-grained empirical study we did, um, but we, our hypotheses were cons confirmed that we, these regular access patterns are really common. We also looked at stencils and found that in our corpus, 55% of all array computations were stencils and roughly 6% corresponded to reductions. So we took all of this data that we collected and from that we designed a specification language for this sort of 70%-ish of, of array computations, these common patterns that we were seeing. And we were also influenced by some of the numerical and, uh, uh, analysis literature as well in terms of some of the terminology we use. So we borrowed some of their terms because a lot of these array computations are derived from doing numerical analysis procedures to convert a bunch of continuous partial differentials into a discrete um, simulation. So as a very quick, a uh, very short uh, example of one of our specifications, we have the following. This is a stencil computation and we can give it the following specification that says A, the array A is involved in a stencil computation and it's accessed in a centered way um, in its first dimension to a depth of, of one. So that means we use AI, AI minus one, and A plus one. And we insert these specifications as comments into the code. So that's one particular way of describing a sort of region of accesses. That's the symmetrical one. You can also do the asymmetrical one where you're just sort of looking forwards in one dimension uh, to some particular depth, depth one here, or looking backwards, uh, also an asymmetrical pattern. And you can describe the case where you're just looking at the, the, the origin point. You're doing a sort of pointwise transformation, pointwise read from an array. That's called a pointed region. And notice here we've got, uh, we've got a parameter that is the dimension, dimension number. We've also got the depth. And so we can make that depth bigger. We can say, well, we've got a centered pattern to depth of two. So we've got AI minus one, plus one, minus two, plus two, and so on for the others. Now, from our data, we also noticed that sometimes the, uh, the origin point was missing. You're, you're sort of straddling. You had a pattern that was straddling the origin, but not including the origin. So we have a sort of modifier you can include called not pointed, which drops that out. So these describe these sort of sets of array accesses happening in a computation. So that's the four combinators. Uh, so that's the four constants, and there are two combinators, multiply and plus, for combining these region descriptions. So let's have a look at how that works. Say I've described a centered region in one dimension to a depth of one. I can then multiply this by another region. Here we are in dimension two, and that gives us a kind of bounding box of the two regions. Or you can think of it as a Cartesian product or a conjunction of the constraints specified by the two regions. So now we've described this sort of block of array access, which corresponds to code that might look a bit like this. You're reading from the central point and all of the elements around it. So here's another example where I've got a uh, a one-dimensional pattern, but in the context of a two-dimensional array. So I've got centered in one dimension and I'm pointed in the other. So it gives us this little slice. Now, the plus operator lets us combine these things by sort of overlaying them. You can think of this as a disjunction of constraints. So this describes here a very classic pattern, which you often see in image processing, uh, the game of life, uh, a cellular automata, called a five-point stencil, where we read from the current element the one above, below, right, and left. So that comes by taking the, sort of combining these two regions by overlaying them. So we also can specify this. There's two kinds of specification you can give. One for stencil computations. That then means you have, you're writing into an array and you're using induction variables consistently to, to say which element you want to write into. There's also access specifications, which are useful for things like reductions, where you're just you're reading in from an array, but you're not necessarily writing into an array. You're maybe uh, collecting some value. 
and we have a few modifiers on specifications. Sometimes you've got some sort of slightly weird pattern that we can't capture, and instead you can give an upper bound specification and a lower bound specification, so you can do some approximation. And there's a special modifier which we, which we found was really important from our uh, data analysis study, which basically says this array access pattern has no repeated indices. So if I do AI plus one, J minus one, that doesn't occur again. And that's quite important for, for, for getting rid of bugs. So back to our fluid dynamics, our big horrible dense code. This is captured by two specifications. One says that U is involved in a stencil computation and it's the five point stencil shape. Uh, and notice you, you, it, the kind of specifica specification captures the symmetry of, of the five point stencil in, in its combinators there. And V is used uh, in a stencil computation with a, with a little box that's forward in one dimension and backward in the other. We can make this more fine grained and put specifications on individual statements or break the statements up to get even more tighter assurances. But these two specifications summarize the whole uh, spatial properties of this array computation. So that's the language. We actually now need a verification tool so that people can write specifications and check their code against them. So we do this in the following way. We have a, a program analysis that then uh, basically outputs sets of integer vectors which describe sort of relative offsets in uh, n-dimensional space. And we have a denotational model for our specifications which actually goes into a sort of subset of this space. Um, it's uh, something very similar but described by um, intervals. So in order to do checking, we can map the specifications into their model, we map the code into this, um, this larger domain, and then checking just basically comes down to deciding set equality, or doing set inequality if we have an approximation. Now, that sounds great at first, you know, just comparing two sets, but actually these sets can be infinite when you have unconstrained dimensions. So, Instead, we convert to some simple integer bound formulation, and then we just throw it at an off-the-shelf SMT solver. We use Z3, um, and that works really well. The data from our empirical study shows that actually this is always really efficient because the problems are quite small from an SMT point of view. The dimensionality is never that big. The number of terms involved is never too, too large. Now, Based on this sort of model idea, we can then do inference of specifications, and, and also we, our tool synthesizes them into code, if you would like. So that's really useful for learning how the specification system works. You can throw some code at it and say, hey, what's the specification for this? And it can generate it for you and insert it into your program. Or if you start with a very large piece of code, you know, some of our project partners have huge pieces of code. We can run our specification mode and insert all the specs for them, and then going forward in the future, this will help them maintain their code base. So what we do is we, we take the code, we do the analysis that puts us here. We then have a set covering algorithm, which is in the paper, um, sort of a fixed point algorithm that takes us into the model, and then we essentially invert the, the semantics to generate specifications from the model. All the details in the paper, along with the soundness theorems about these, these um, semantic operations. So we wanted to evaluate our tool, so we applied it back to our initial corpus. We wanted to see like, how applicable are these specification combinators and idioms. So we applied it onto the corpus, and uh, using our inference mode, we, it generated 87,000 specifications. Um, most of those are stencils, but we also saw some access ones. We have uh, reductions and things like that. Now, a lot of these are very trivial specifications. They just involve the pointed regions. So this is sort of point-wise traversals, conversions of data, and things like that. Ones that involve a single action, it was, a, it was sort of uh, just under 10% of all those specifications, so one forward, backward, or centered. And the non-pointed did, did appear quite often there as well, so that was a good choice adding that. The more interesting ones is then we, when we start to get down to multiple actions, having forward and backward together, sort of more interesting access patterns. And there's roughly a thousand of these. So actually, in 1.1 million lines, that's, that's quite a lot of targets for sort of putting these specifications. These are places where users are likely to, uh, that there's a sort of real possibility they'll make some mistake in the indexing patterns. Now, it's worth pointing out that there's only 327 of these specifications that are bounded ones that have an at most or an at least. So you know, we could have 
generated loads of approximate specifications, but in fact, our specifications are almost always very tight. Um, so that kind of goes back to our initial hypotheses that these patterns are very regular, and we can describe them with a small set of combinators. Uh, read once really appeared a lot as well, so it's useful to have that in as well as a modifier. More details about that in the paper and, and what that's useful for. So it's worth pointing out that our, verif our verification tool is not one of these sort of push-button push tools where you put your code in it and it says, oh, there's a bug here, here, and here, and here. You have to provide specifications because you have to describe, well, what is the intent? What is my intent as a programmer? And does the code match that intent? So we thought, well, how can we then generate some data about how useful this is for catching real bugs? So we took some of the, one of the version control history of one of our um, packages, and we ran the inference mode over successive versions. And we looked for places where the specifications changed. We then compared that with the commit messages, and indeed did find things where people said, oh no, you know, this is fixing this bug, where we did AI, but we actually meant AI plus one. So in that case, you know, our specification language would have been helpful there. They could have written the right specification, or it might have given them a chance to think about what they really meant there. We also saw um, uh, several examples of the following, where people would flip around the uh, role of certain dimensions in array. So they might be switching from row major to column major, um, or they might have just been sort of trying to reorganize things. So that corresponds to, to flipping around the names of the dimensions in a specification, the sort of the number of them. So our tool would be useful here as well, because what you could do is write the spec, and then write the flipped round spec, run the checking mode, and find all the places where the code doesn't conform to that spec, and those are the bits you need to go and refactor. And you just do that throughout your code base, and then everything's consistent. So to summarize, we started off with trying to collect some data. And I know this is this sort of optimizing compilation and verification session. So um, this data could also, I th we think it could be really useful for people doing optimizing compilers. You know, we have some data about how people actually use arrays in scientific computing, or if you want to build other verification tools, that can also be useful data. We designed our specification language out of that. And as you've seen, you know, I've, I've shown you the whole thing. It's very simple. Just these four region combinators and plus a multiply and a couple of modifiers. And that captures 70% of all uh, patterns. In the paper, we have all the nice things you'd expect about the sort of language theory, the denotational models, soundless results. And then we applied that back in our evaluation to our corpus. It's open source, you can go and get it here. The artifact is evaluated. Some of the code we applied it to is closed source, so we can't, um, we have special licenses, so we couldn't distribute that. But we also applied it to lots of open source stuff. And as a sort of final takeaway, I'd encourage you all to walk over that chasm, to find a bridge over that chasm now and then, and talk to the scientists, because they really need our help. They're doing great stuff. They're, they're predicting how our, our world works, our climate works, things like that. And they are desperate for tools to help them to do that. So that's what we're trying to do here. And we're now working with our project partners to integrate it into their daily coding lives. Thank you very much. <laughs>